a very warm welcome to all of you and especially to our distinguished Rising Asia annual lecture by uh, lecturer, Professor Tommy Ko of Singapore, uh, whom we will introduce in detail in a minute. <laughs> At the moment, uh, we just wanted to say that uh, I remember in the 1980s, I was a journalist with the Straits Times uh, group, uh, the Business Times, and uh, I used to attend Professor Tommy Coase's uh, press conferences when he was the head of the Institute of Policy Studies. And before those press conferences began yeah. or before Professor Co began his events, he would always say, in the beginning, I would like to recognize these important people who are there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember, Tom, Professor Co used to say that. Yeah. I, I wish to recognize, you know, so and so and so and so. So, so let us, uh, <laughs> as the uh, your your co-hosts uh, Julie and me, recognize some of the people who have who are present here uh, to listen to your important speech. And uh, so, uh, let me begin with uh, our uh, senior minister from Cambodia, who you know very well. Senior Minister Muli Ieng, yes. who has been a diplomat from his teenage days, I think. <laughs> and, uh, he's still stuck on. I mean, you know, he, he seems to love his job. He still he's looks like a teenager. In, in running the AIDS program for his country and is currently again uh, re-elected and appointed Senior Minister. We, we have uh, um, from Canada, Senator... Uh, Yun Pao Wu, who is uh, oh. from British Columbia, and yeah. he is uh, yeah. also known to Professor yeah. Ko very okay. well, as okay. well as to, as to uh, Mr. Ieng Muli. Um, and he, of course, has a long standing interest in all affairs Asian, uh, is, is, a, is a wonderful writer himself, a think tank thinker, and, uh, and still writes actively. Um, then I would like to recognize uh, our, the president of our Rising Asia Foundation, Mr. Anirudh Dalheri, uh, who, ha who, comes, uh, who has served for many years as the CEO of the Telegraph, which is uh, owned by the Ananda Bazar Patrika Group. And as the, as the managing director of that group, uh, he organized important television alliances with Star TV, and uh, he's then had a long track record pre previously with the Unilever group uh, based in Rotterdam and headed several other groups. Um, then, of course, our old dear friend, the, the novelist Meera Chand. Yes, I see. <laughs> Hi, Meera. <laughs> yes, uh, who, who we all know very well, but she, she's a, a wonderful novelist who continues writing. And she lives in Singapore now, and she's been an old friend of hers. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm the chairman of the Mira Chan Fan Club in Singapore. Right. <laughs> okay. Good way to be. Listen. Then we have to introduce our own uh, consulting editor and Rising Asia board member, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh, who's here, who recently went to Singapore, yeah. where he had a meeting with uh, Professor Ko, which yeah. Professor Ko will remember yeah. very well. Uh, we recognize uh, a former Indian ambassador, Mr. Amit Das Gupta, who is here. Uh, I hope I'm not missing others. We Then there is uh, um, Joanne Lin, who works in yeah. Singapore, who Professor Ko knows. Yeah. Uh, she works for the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies as an excellent analyst. Um, we have Professor um, um, Lan Lundika Hanamte from India, who is on our editorial board. We have Mohini Pradhan, who works uh, for our Rising Asia Foundation and Journal as a staff person. We have uh, Professor Nguyen Nguyen from the University of Alaska. Uh, she's Vietnamese and is working on an excellent new study of Vietnamese diplomacy. We mm -hmm. have Mr. Raj Sharma from Singapore, who is Indian and has degrees from the United States. He's on our board. He's joined us. Uh, professor Salukyu Sangtam from the Northeast uh, in, of India. He's a professor there. 
and he is also a regular contributor to to our journal and, and, a, and an active book reviewer. Um, then we have uh, Mr. William Hui that I see there, yeah. uh, and uh, welcome him, um, Mr. Sanket Joshi, uh, and uh, I see a few others uh, such as uh, Mr. Kalamuddin Khan. Welcome. Uh, welcome to Mr. Gautam, uh, to Professor Anuradha Chatterjee from Loreto College, uh, who is uh, senior a senior colleague of Julie's at Loreto College. So with those words, uh, yeah. we I would welcome, uh, since introductions are done, I would ask uh, our co-host, uh, Dr. Julie Mehta, to, uh, to begin uh, proceedings. Tommy Ko is currently Emeritus Professor of Law, at the National University of Singapore, Ambassador at Large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Chairman of the International Advisory Panel of the Center for International Law at the NUS. Professor Ko has served as Dean of the Faculty of Law of the NUS, Singapore's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, Ambassador to the United States of America, High Commissioner to Canada and Ambassador to Mexico. He was President of the Third UN Conference on the Law of the Sea. He was also the Chairman of the Preparatory Committee for and the main committee of the UN Conference on the Environment and Development, the Earth Summit. He was the UN Secretary General Special Envoy to Russia, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. He was the founding chairman of the National Arts Council founding executive director of the Asia Europe Foundation and former chairman of the National Heritage Board of Singapore. He was Singapore's chief negotiator in negotiating an agreement to establish diplomatic relations between Singapore and China. He was also Singapore's chief negotiator for the US-Singapore Free Trade uh, Agreement he acted as Singapore's agent in two legal disputes with Malaysia. He has chaired two dispute panels for the WTO. He is the co chairman of the Singapore China Forum and the Japan Singapore Symposium. Professor Tommy Ko has received awards. The litany of awards is too many to mention here. But the main ones are from the governments of Singapore, Chile, Finland, France, Japan, and the Netherlands, Spain, and the United States. Professor Ko received the chair, the, the champion of the Earth Award, UNEP, and the inaugural President's Award for the Environment from Singapore. He was conferred honorary doctoral degrees in law by Yale and Monash universities, Harvard University, conferred on him the greatest negotiator award in 2014. My first encounter with the inventive, innovative and inclusive Prof Tomiko, as we always call him, Way, way back in the 1990s, after the UNTAC elections, if you remember, Prof. Ko, uh, and you were hands-on as always. I was a features editor in the Singapore <laughs> Press Holdings, and that was my day job. My real interest was the elections. I was enthralled by the way the Cambodian classical dance had come back with a handful of seven dancers, the rest being decimated by the Khmer Rouge. Uh, when I wanted to bring this limping dance back onto the world stage, it was Professor Tommy Ko who blessed us with the National Arts Council in Singapore, yeah. collaborating with the government of Cambodia and my working for about two years before that with the minister, Mr. Nut Narang, Minister of Culture, whom I think Prof. Ko would also remember, and Princess Bupa Devi, great admirer of Prof. Ko's. And then um, it was a great success, uh, and the dance began to 
travel, which was what I had originally prayed for. After about eight years, when I finally got to finishing my book on Cambodian dance, um, it was Prof Ko I turned to for a foreword. <laughs> that, for that, I owe you a huge debt of gratitude, Prof Ko. Um, and, and thank you for, for all the inspiration that you continue to light under us. Thank you, Prof Ko. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Um, I have a few words to say and uh, to, to welcome Professor Ko. Professor Ko, you and I go back many years when I was just a young journalist uh, with the Business Times of Singapore and attending your press conferences. And uh, we've kept in touch over the years. And I'm glad for that. And I'm glad to find you in great health and uh, as the author of 25 books. And uh, I guess we are not even counting anymore. <laughs> so with that, with those few words, uh, I will request uh, Mr. Aniruddha Lahiri, who is our uh, president of the Rising Asia Foundation, to say a few words of, of welcome. Well, uh, Professor Ko, um, we're really looking forward to this day. Let me add my own word of welcome to that of Harish and others uh, to give us this opportunity to listen to you and that too on our annual uh, lecture you know we i've heard a lot of you i've read your background and i'm sure that we are going to have an excellent an excellent one hour of listening to you so professor in future i'm sure there will be other opportunities to meet you in person but at this point in time, yeah. let me not stand between you and the others who are here. And my welcome to all the others who joined this, uh, uh, joined this lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I would like to begin by thanking my old friends, Harish and Julie Mehta, and the Rising Asia Journal and Foundation for inviting me to deliver this lecture. I miss having them in Singapore. And I still regard Harish and Julie as two of my gurus on Cambodia. Uh, I will now say a few words about the topic that Harish assigned to me, which is will ASEAN survive the US-China confrontation? I will begin by saying a few words about ASEAN. ASEAN is a regional organization of Southeast Asia, just as SAC is a regional organization of South Asia. Let me tell you the story, how it all began. On the 8th of August, 1967, the foreign ministers of five ASEAN countries Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore and Thailand met in Bangkok. They took a leap of faith and signed the Bangkok Declaration establishing ASEAN. Why do I say it was a leap of faith? I say it was a leap of faith because in 1967, Although we were neighbors, we hardly knew each other. The Indonesian had been ruled by the Dutch, Malaysia and Singapore by the British, the Philippines by the Spanish and then by the Americans, and Thailand had remained independent. In spite of our differences, we did not speak the same language, we did not worship the same God. In spite of all these differences, ASEAN has been a great success. It has grown from strength to strength. Today, ASEAN includes all the 10 countries of Southeast Asia. And very soon, we will welcome our 11 member, Timor Leste. The 10 economies of ASEAN have been integrated 
into a single economy. And the 10 economies have been growing annually at around 4 to 5 percent. The experts predict that by 2030, the ASEAN economy could be the fourth largest in the world. So economically, ASEAN has been very successful. Politically, ASEAN has played a very important part in promoting peace in Southeast Asia. ASEAN has kept the peace in the region for over 50 years. It has promoted amity and cooperation between and among the countries of the Asia-Pacific region or the Indo-Pacific region. I don't know whether you know that the three countries of Northeast Asia, namely China, Japan and South Korea, had never met among themselves until we ASEAN invited them to attend an ASEAN plus three forum. And in the beginning, the comfort level between the three of them was quite low. So they met at breakfast. And when the comfort level rose, they then met at lunch and finally at dinner. There is a trilateral free trade agreement negotiated between Japan, South, China, South, no, China, Japan, South Korea. But the agreement had never been signed and had not come into force because of political difficulty between them. So the role that ASEAN has played is not just in Southeast Asia, but we are also trying to promote cooperation and peace in Northeast Asia. ASEAN is the convener and neutral chairman of many regional forums. Apart from ASEAN Plus Three, we are also the convener and chairman of the ASEAN Regional Forum, and very importantly, the East Asia Summit. The East Asia Summit is very important because it's a forum that includes two pairs of adversaries, United States and China, United States and Russia, are all members of the East Asia Summit. Each year, the leaders of the most important countries in the world come to Southeast Asia to attend the ASEAN Summit. The convening power of ASEAN is probably unique. I can think of no other regional organization that has the same convening power. In fact, uh, Harish and Julie, you might consider asking someone to write your book comparing ASEAN and SAC, you know, and see whether there are any lessons that SAC can learn from ASEAN. As I said just now, ASEAN is the convener and neutral chairman of ASEAN Plus Three, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the East Asia Summit. ASEAN is able to play this role because we are neutral and trusted by the superpowers and the major powers. The moment ASEAN become disunited or partisan, we will no longer be a credible convener and chairman. So the question really this morning is, will the confrontation between the United States and China pull ASEAN apart? Now, let me now turn to the relation between the United States and China. I want to share with you the three historical periods or phases in which I want to describe this relationship. The first historical period would be from the founding of PRC in 1949 until 1972 when President Nixon shocked the world by visiting China. During this first period, 1949 to 1972, the United States and China were enemies. Their armed forces actually fought each other in the Korean War. 
and they had no diplomatic relations between them. Nixon's visit changed everything. And it started what I call the second historical period from 1972 until the end of the Cold War. During the Cold War, the United States and China were de facto allies. They were not de jure allies, there were no, no treaty between them, but they were de facto allies. They were allies because they had a common enemy, the Soviet Union. But once the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union disappeared, this relationship was bound to change. During the second period, the US policy was to bring China out of isolation and introduce China into the mainstream of the world. The United States facilitated China's admission to WTO. The United States had expected that China would change when its economy took off. This, in my view, was a false expectation because the Chinese Communist Party had no intention to loosen its grip on power or to become more democratic in the Western sense. And because it, the Americans have this false expectation, uh, they were disappointed and they felt that their relationship with China was not successful. During the second period, I would say the relationship between the United States and China was based partly on cooperation and partly on competition. We are now in the third period of US-China relations. Unlike President Obama, who did not regard the rise of China as posing a threat to American global leadership, President Trump did. And it was President Trump who started a trade war against China by imposing tariffs on Chinese exports. And it was also President Trump who began the process of decoupling the economy and technology. The surprising thing is that although President Biden served for eight years as President Obama's vice president, he did not follow Obama's China policy. Instead, President Biden has followed essentially President Trump's China policy. He has not removed the tariffs that President Trump imposed on China. He has in fact augmented decoupling more extensively than Trump did. Decoupling trade, technology, investment, and so on. President Biden has also tried to mobilize the support of other democracy against China and other autocracy. The fundamental reason for President Biden China policy is that the Americans in general and the US government in particular view a rising China as a peer competitor. I repeat that. President Biden's China policy is based upon the American perception of rising China as a peer competitor. And uh, I, I spent over 20 years of my life in America. I think I understand American character and values and vision. America is determined to remain number one. And if necessary, America will fight against any country that challenges its global hegemony. President Xi Jinping has described the China policy of the United States as consisting of three things, encirclement, containment, and suppression. 
in view of this, the Chinese are not very keen about American overtures to begin dialogue at all levels. They feel that the Americans are not sincere. And the Chinese regard de-risking, the, the new word de-risking, as just a synonym for decoupling. Uh, a very good friend of mine in Washington, Professor David Shombo, an American expert of China, has recently written a book uh, entitled Where Great Powers Meet America and China in Southeast Asia. He argues in the book that of all the regions of the world, the one region that will experience the most intense rivalry between the United States and China is Southeast Asia. So I come back to my question. Will the confrontation between the United States and China pull ASEAN apart? There's certainly a danger that it will do so because some member country of ASEAN have already chosen sides. I think America, the Philippines is an American ally and uh, if I'm not wrong, Cambodia can be considered as a Chinese ally. However, when the 10 leaders of ASEAN meet by themselves, there is a consensus among them that ASEAN as an organization must remain united and neutral. And at the recent ASEAN summit in Jakarta, our chairman, President Joko Widodo, said in a, pump, in a press conference that ASEAN is nobody's ally, that ASEAN is not an ally of any great power. I'm therefore cautiously optimistic that ASEAN will survive the US-China cooperation. But whether I'm right or wrong, only the future will tell. Thank you. I'm happy to respond to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your wide-ranging talk, uh, which, uh, which took us back to the uh, past uh, when ASEAN was formed, the conditions it was formed under. Uh, you took us into um, uh, the fact that uh, the United States does view um, China as its principal ally uh, for the exertion of global dominance and power. But you are hopeful at the same time that the confrontation doesn't become too damaging, that, that the confrontation... So, so what I'm reading from you is that you're, you're hopeful that ASEAN is able to somehow balance the two powers. Uh, so with those very brief brief words, um, I would welcome uh, any questions uh, from the audience uh, that may be there. Uh, I, I think, think I, I see Ambassador Gurjit Singh's hand. Yes, yes, Gurjit, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Ko. What a delight to see you <laughs> again and hear you again, as erudite and clear as ever. Three things. First, you asked whether there is any comparison between SARC and ASEAN. ASEAN is a reasonably successful organization. SARC is a dysfunctional organization. So anybody who writes a book on this will only end up in the trash bin. So there is nothing to compare success with failure. The second part is you are very candid about the challenges to ASEAN emerging from the China-US rivalry. And you have even said some countries are siding this way and that way. But the dismay is in the lack of unity, not only on this issue, but on issues internal to ASEAN, which is making ASEAN's position as a neutral player more difficult. But my question to you is this, 
many countries in the world are resorting to the reconvening of the global south as a reaction to the big power rivalry you see india's g20 position you see the brick summit yet asean is neutral even from the global south so where does asean really want to go be neutral from everybody not even identify with the global south thank you um, thank you very much ambassador gujit singh very happy to see you online and i remember with uh, great pleasure our meeting in singapore recently i would uh, disagree with you that asean is disunited i think asean is united we the 10 of us agree that asean as an organization will not take sides individual country may take side but asean as an organization will remain neutral we will not take side and this was confirmed again at the recent summit in Jakarta. So I'm not sure why you say ASEAN is not united. Uh, we, are, we are, I mean, compared to other regional organizations, not just South, but even compared to the European Union, I think we are more united than the European Union is. And, and you know, I, want to, I don't want to be boastful, but I think ASEAN is one of the most successful regional organizations in the world. To be sure, we have some disagreement. For example, Myanmar. You didn't mention Myanmar. But Myanmar is a very difficult case. Right? And there's some disagreement among ourselves on Myanmar. But we can talk about that if somebody is interested in Myanmar. Um, I'll take another question. Yes, so we have a question from uh, Senior Minister Ian Muli and then by Professor Newitt Nguyen. In that order, please. Thank you, Ambassador Ko, for your brilliant lecture. I just want to respond that there are wrong perceptions about Cambodia. As you said, some believe, especially Westerners, believe that we align with China. But look at our vote at the United Nations regarding the war, uh, Russian war against Ukraine. We support the majority of nations that condemn the invasion of Ukraine. Why other countries like Vietnam, who are supposed to be a good friend of the United States, they vote neutral? So I just come back to one very simple nation in diplomacy. We believe that, as General de Gaulle said, in French, les hommes peuvent avoir des amis, mais les nations jamais. So it means that men can have friends, but no nation. Nation have only interest. Our interest is in respect of international law. We are a small country. We cannot ally with China against the United States or ally the United States with the United States against China. So I agree also with you that. ASEAN is united. As you said, we cannot uh, accept to be alive with China or with the uh, United States. We want to be friends with both of them because they provide interest to us. You know, we probably have a, a lot of uh, uh, trade with China or we receive a lot of uh, economic support from China. But we are uh, uh, grateful to the United States, to Europe that opened their market to our government factor, uh, worker uh, uh, product. So, so this is a wrong, a wrong perception about Cambodia. We, uh, in our constitution, it spell clearly that we must be neutral. So this is what I want to, to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your respond. I would, um, <clears throat> I would say that um, your colleagues in ASEAN uh, view you as a Chinese ally because you have a, a track record of protecting Chinese interests, even when it's against the other ASEAN countries. So we all remember that 
in 2012, when Cambodia was chairman of the ASEAN. And for the first time in ASEAN history, Cambodia blocked the adoption of the joint communique of the foreign minister, just because it contained a paragraph on the South China Sea that China could not accept. And the Chinese were stupid enough to actually boast that Cambodia was acting on their behest. You know. So, I mean, that's part of the historical record, you know. But I'm happy, I'm happy to hear from you that Cambodian policy is to be independent, not to be an ally of any great power. I thank you for your clarification. Professor uh, Newitt Newen, please. I, I, I am a very junior member here, so it is such a great honor for me to hear from such distinguished and seasoned diplomats and scholars. Um, that's why my question is going to be very, very basic because there's just not a lot of things that I understand. Uh, so um, could you explain to me when you said that ASEAN was uh, a was uh, the most unified, um, even more than the European Union, as well as when you said that um, it, it was a very successful organization. Uh, so from from the surface, what I could see is the you know, uh, the Euro European Union had a, a common um, uh, currency, for example. Um, so could you please explain to me in what way ASEAN was a unified and a successful organization, and some to some extent even more than more so than than uh, the uh, European Union, or I guess you 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 implied that it was even more successful than other organizations that that existed. Thank you. Um, that that's not a simple question. Um, ASEAN is successful in that we've united all the countries of Southeast Asia, which are very different from one another, into a family. We have developed a very strong culture of consulting, cooperating, of arriving at consent. So in spite of great odds, unlike the European where they have a common culture, common religion, in Southeast Asia, there are no such commonality. But in spite of the absence of such commonality, we have successfully forged a community. And the 10 of us are very united in economics and also in politics. Um, we have managed to integrate our 10 economy into a single economy. And as I say, the ASEAN economy is growing at around eight, four to five percent per annum, and according to the World Bank and other international organizations, if we continue to make progress at this pace, by 2030 we could be the fourth largest economy in the world. And and you know, we have kept the peace in the region, which is strategically very important to the great power. Much more than that, we've tried to promote amity and cooperation with the other countries in the region, such as we brought together China, Japan, and South Korea, which they never met before. We have a forum that includes countries who have very difficult relations with each other, the United States and China, United States and Russia. And, and we, we managed to link the ASEAN economy to all the other major economies of the world, except the United States and the European Union. ASEAN is a free trade agreement with China, with Japan, with South Korea, with India, with Australia, with New Zealand. And so the ASEAN economy is linked to the economies of these other countries. It gives us, it enlarges our economic sphere, it enlarges our political space. You know? So I would say all in all, we are a very successful organization. We are different from the European. We will never have a common currency. And I would say that uh, even in the case of the European Union, not all 27 members are part of the Eurozone. You know, 
some country have opted out of the Eurozone. We don't have a, we don't have a court. Uh, we don't have a parliament. But these are steps into the future, in long future. We, we focus on what's practical, what can be done. Thank you for that. And uh, may I bring in uh, Senator Yuen, uh, if he's... Uh, if he's there, uh, if, you if you have a comment or a question. It's lovely to hear from you again, Professor Ko. Um, I put my question in the chat, and it, it has to do with what I think is the litmus test for ASEAN to navigate uh, US-China rivalry, and that is whether ASEAN can um, diffuse tension in the South China Sea without seeming to side with either the US or China. Is that possible? I think the rivalry between the United States and China <laughs> extends way beyond the South China Sea. You know, the rivalry between them is partly ideological, partly economic, partly technological, and, and partly economic. So, you know, actually we are in a very dangerous period in world history. The two superpowers, the United States and China, are, in my view, on a collision course. And they could collide over Taiwan or on some other issues on which they have diametrically opposite interests. There is a total lack of strategic trust between Washington and Beijing. So this is really serious, you know, it's, it's way beyond the South China Sea and way beyond the East China Sea. I mean, this is really, really serious. On, on the South China Sea, as you know, four ASEAN countries have claims to the South China Sea. These are Brunei, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam. The remaining six of us, we are not claimant states. But we insist that the disputes in the South China Sea should be resolved peacefully in accordance with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and international law. That's our, that's our collective position. And if, if I could just... Wait, wait, let me finish. Yeah. And ASEAN and China are currently engaged in negotiating a code of conduct in the South China Sea. You know, you can't negotiate such an important code if there's an absence of trust between the parties. And I would say respectfully to my Chinese friends, if they are listening, that at the moment, there's a deficit of trust between China and Vietnam and China and the Philippines. And in this atmosphere, country don't trust China. It's very difficult for us to make progress in the negotiations on the code of conduct. You know. So if you ask me what's Singapore's position, Singapore's position is that we support the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. We tell all the claimant countries, your claim must be consistent with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and international law. And if you have a dispute with each other, solve it peacefully in accordance with the mechanisms in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. That's our position. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, for the question, uh, Senator Wu and uh, Professor Ko, your wonderful answer. May I request uh, the author, Meera Chand, if she has a question or a comment to make, please? I don't have a question for Prof. Ko, but I, I do have a comment in that. Um, this, for me, you know, I'm, I'm not a political person, so I'm very happy through this time with Prof. Co to be silent and to listen and to learn. 
and and really i'm learning a lot just listening <laughs> to you now so thank you mira thank i'm you. happy to hear other people's questions and and learn thank you uh, thank, thank you, you. mira uh, uh, yeah, yeah th th there's a uh, uh, i think uh, um, uh, mr anirudh lahiri has a question go ahead anida yeah thank you uh, that was delightful uh, your presentation dr professor ko thank, thank you you know you alluded to in your lecture you alluded to myanmar uh, but you didn't go into the details i'm sure there was a reason for it in terms of constraint time or whatever but i just wanted a, an answer to a very simple question which is that myanmar sticks out as a sore thumb you know and people seem to be ignoring and saying that well you know it's a spoiled child let it do whatever it wants to do on its own you know and there seems to be absolutely no intervention from anybody so this is not a very stable situation it's not i mean in surely is not an uh, situation i mean which is in equilibrium so i wanted to know from you dr ko where does where does myanmar feature into this whole uh, the asian scene Uh, in terms is, of his policies. Myanmar is a very important member of the ASEAN family uh, by its strategic location as a neighbor of both China and India. Uh, it's of great value to the region and to ASEAN. We want to keep Myanmar in the ASEAN family. You may not know that I was the chairman of the task force that drafted the ASEAN Charter in 2007. And during the drafting process, we asked our foreign minister, should we include in the ASEAN Charter a provision to suspend or expel a member? Because we envisage a future when uh, you may have a member behave very badly, you know, and brings ill repute to the organization. So we wanted to ask our 10 foreign ministers. We, I remember we met in Siem Reap in Cambodia. We asked them, Ministers, should we include in the Charter a provision to suspend a country or to expel a country? And the ministers unanimously said no. We don't want to suspend or expel a country, even if it's behaved badly. We want to keep it in the family so that it can hear what the re remaining members of the family are saying. So this is our, our philosophy, you know. We keep Myanmar in the family, even though what the military regime has done is unacceptable. But we punish the military regime by not allowing the military rulers to attend ASEAN meetings. ASEAN can be represented by the civil servant, but not by the military ruler. And Thank you. That's an excellent answer. I'll tell you more. Give you more. Two years ago, yeah, please. two years please. ago, you know the coup took place on the 1st of February, two years ago. Yes. Two months later in April, the ASEAN leaders had a special meeting in Jakarta. And the ASEAN leaders invited the leader of the military junta, General Min Ong Liang, to join them at a meeting in Jakarta. At the end of the meeting, the ASEAN leaders, including General Min Ong Liang, adopted a five-point consensus, which is the ASEAN peace plan. What are the most important elements of the five-point consensus? One, the violence must stop. And the military rulers have not stopped the violence it is using against its opponents. In fact, just yesterday, they bombed a refugee camp in a Kachin state. This is totally unacceptable. The violence continues. Second, ASEAN urges the military rule leaders and, and other political stakeholders to come back to the negotiating table. 
and talk to one another and forge an agreement on how they would govern themselves. The military ruler rejected this. He continued to imprison the LDP leaders. <clears throat> so the second element of the five-point consensus is also not acceptable. We have not given up. You know, there are some members of ASEAN who have grown impatient and say, let's be realistic. The military is in power. They're, got, they're not going to give up power. Let's talk to them. Let's, let's work with them. So I'm sorry to say that uh, internally we are somewhat divided because Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam have met by themselves. And they were they are they are more willing to talk to the military junta in Myanmar. But the rest of us said no. We adopted by consensus the five point consensus April 2021. We must stick to it. And I'm happy to tell you that at the last ASEAN meeting in Jakarta, the 10 leaders confirmed their continued commitment to the five point consensus. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. It was a big thing, a lot of uh, clarity. Thank you, uh, uh, Onida, for your question and Professor Ko for that uh, very, very candid, uh, candid response. Um, uh, may I request uh, our former Indian ambassador, Mr. Amit Das Gupta, to ask a question or a comment, please? I just wanted to say um, a big thank you to all the organizers of this event. It's it's always a pleasure to listen to Professor Ko. Um, I know several Indian diplomats, and I'm sure diplomats from across the globe hold him in very high regard and respect and indeed admiration. So thank you very much, Professor Ko. My question really is uh, to, to ask about the, the complex uh, situation in uh, the Indo-Pacific and uh, what you see as ASEAN's response to uh, to Quad and also to AUKUS. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Ambassador, for your very kind uh, comments. When the Cold War ended, many of us rejoiced and that we are so happy that we are now we're not, no longer living in a divided world. But I'm sorry to say that the world has again become divided into two rival blocks. And you have on the, on the one hand, a block led by the United States, which includes Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, the five eyes, the European Union, NATO, Japan, South Korea, and then you have the other bloc led by China, which includes Russia, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, and so on. Iran, Iran. This is the unhappy situation we are in the world today. And even in my region, which I continue to call the Asia Pacific, there's a division. And uh, the Chinese bloc views Quad as a hostile organization. I think the Chinese Foreign Minister Huang Yi, who is quite outspoken, once described Quad as a NATO of the Asia Pacific. And I don't know, I don't know what other words were used against AUKUS, but clearly, clearly the Chinese see both Quad and AUKUS as hostile to China. But I pointed out to the Chinese, I pointed out Chinese, that although India is, in, is a member of Quad, India is not a member of the bloc led by the United States. That India has an independent foreign policy. India is not hostile to Russia. India is not hostile to Iran, two enemies of the United States. So India cannot be put into the bloc led by the Americans. But on China, on China, the United States and India share the same view. They see China as a disruptive factor. 
we in ASEAN want to stay neutral. We don't want to be part of the Quad. We're not hostile to the Quad because the four member countries, the Quad are all friends of ours. We are, we're not hostile to AUKUS because the three countries of AUKUS are all friends of ours. But we understand that in this divided world, once again divided, one side, the Chinese side, views Quad and AUKUS as hostile to their interests. And therefore, we have to be cautious in the way we deal with Quad and with AUKUS, even though all of them are our friends. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a couple of more questions and one, uh, may I invite uh, Joanne Lin from the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, uh, request her for a question or a comment. Uh, thank you, Prof. Ko, for uh, speaking earlier and of course uh, to Harish for organizing this uh, event. Um, I, I, I actually uh, do not have any questions, but uh, perhaps I could also give some comments. And I thought that there was something that was rather interesting that uh, Prof. Ko mentioned earlier about ASEAN's unity. <laughs> because in fact, I I mean, while Prof. Uh, Prof. Ko was saying that, you know, ASEAN's unity is uh, really then intact and doing way better than the EU. But in fact, I had a whole paper to talk about uh, ASEAN's unity uh, currently uh, being challenged right now uh, because of uh, various uh, regional issues uh, that uh, ASEAN has to face. And of course, I, I agree everything uh, with what Prof said about how successful ASEAN has been. And I think ASEAN's unity in areas of cooperation within ASEAN has worked very well. And this is where we consider it as uh, ASEAN's community building and uh, integration efforts. However, I think where regional issues are concerned, you can see a little bit of a division and of course of where Myanmar is. And I think Prof Ko also mentioned about certain countries like Thailand, Laos and Cambodia, uh, you know, uh, engaging with the SAC. And that was not really in line with uh, what ASEAN planned to do. And of course, South China Sea, we, we know that there are people, there are countries with no positions and whereas there are very strong uh, <coughs> and uh, Vietnam, for example, and of course, <laughs> in, in China uh, uh, is having a real challenge, you know, in the South China Sea right now. <laughs> and I think even, even in the last few days, we saw a little bit of a division arising from the Israel-Hamas war. And I saw a couple of comments that came out to see that ASEAN might be divided, you know, over the positions of who is supporting Israel, who is supporting <coughs> a two-state solution, for example. So, I mean, these are the things that uh, ASEAN has to work uh, together. It ha certainly has agency and ASEAN still matters. We still need ASEAN. But I think uh, ASEAN will definitely need to uh, address uh, two things, how to build greater coherence within the bloc, that's one, and two is how to retain its relevance in the regional architecture, because we also see other major power-led initiatives like the court and AUKUS, these were questions that were clear, <coughs> and whether ASEAN can continue to maintain its centrality in the regional architecture, finding some ways to work with court, for example, you know, that, that sort of things. These are the, the kind of uh, questions that uh, we need to think uh, moving forward. So uh, this is my comments. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I could briefly respond and say that uh, Juan Lin and is a co-coordinator of ASEAN study and the Institute of Southeast Asian Study. I read all her writing and, and I admire her very much. Um, I think on ASEAN unity, you have to understand that unlike the European Union, we don't have a common foreign and security policy. We're still 10 sovereign states. From time to time, we're able to coordinate our position and have a joint position. But, but we are not at a point like the European Union when we, we have a, a single position on foreign security policy. You know? so, so you have to understand that. As for regaining relevance, I would say we've never lost our relevance. You may ask me, isn't ASEAN offended when President Biden recently decided to skip the ASEAN summit and instead he went to Vietnam? I want to try to explain why President Biden did that. 
He's a friend of ASEAN, you know. He hosted a special summit in Washington with the ASEAN leader. And, uh, and I know him very well from his long years in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I know that he is at heart a friend of ASEAN. But we have to understand that currently, the United States suffers from one obsession. And that one obsession is China. Whether you are relevant to me or not, Joanne, depends on whether you join me in opposing China or not. If you are neutral, like ASEAN, you're not so valuable. But if you are Vietnam and you have problems with China, you're more valuable. So if I were in President Biden's shoes, I can understand the calculation that went through my brain and I, why I've decided that I will send Kamala Harris to Jakarta and I'll go to Hanoi. Because in Hanoi, President Biden was able to persuade the Vietnamese to upgrade the bilateral relationship between the two countries to comprehensive strategic position on par with China. And from Washington's point of view, that was important, you know. So it, it is a fact of life whether we are whether we are relevant or less relevant to Washington doesn't depend on us. Depends on Washington. And you know, if if whether I'm valuable to you or not depends on whether I will join you in opposing China, then the problem is Washington, not in not in ASEAN. ASEAN will remain where we are. We will remain united, independent, and neutral. And if the American doesn't like this and downgrade the, our importance of Washington, well, too bad. But we will not change our policy just to please the American. Thank you, uh, Joanne and uh, Professor Ko, <clears throat> for that wide-ranging e explanation, Professor Ko. We have a couple more <clears throat> questions which uh, we can quickly do. One is Dr. Tohanshi, uh, followed by Prof uh, Professor Salikyu. Yeah, Professor Salikyu, uh, can you ask your question? Thank you once again. I mean, uh, I, a wonderful annual lecture here I can organize by Rising Asia. So all thanks to Dr. Harish. Very good job. As always, the lectures are very interesting. And also good to hear uh, from Professor Ko. It was a very nice speech. So um, I, it's not, I have so many questions. I have so many questions and so many um, things I want to clarify. But then I'll just keep it short. Uh, number one is um, just a hypothetical question, and we know that we should not read too much into hypothetical situations, but if today, if India was in a similar situation as China, do you think that the United States would go uh, similarly, would, would have a similar response against India as it is against China? And uh, the stop, second question... Stop. stop. Uh, repeat your question. I don't understand your question. Okay. So... Um, it's, it is just a hypothetical question. So the thing is, if India was in a similar position like China today, if it was India instead of China being the rising power in Asia, oh. do you think, yeah, do you think that the United States would respond to China or to India as it is responding to China today? So that's the first question. The second question that I have is that help me make sense of this because I think uh, most of the questions have been revolving around this. So just. Help me uh, make sense of this. You see, I see histor historically, I see that uh, since Singapore, for example, since uh, the former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yee, he has always approached India to be a counterweight against China since before the end of Cold War. On the other hand, you have historically Vietnam, which is against China, which is again a member of ASEAN. You have another issue with Philippines which is having an issue with China, with China in South China Sea. And you also have Indonesia on top of that. And also you have the issues with Myanmar. Now, Myanmar and Cambodia, I understand. And I think uh, it is some sort of an Asian values which the Western countries fail to understand us. So you have all these different dynamics in one organization called ASEAN, full of tension, right? Do you think that in the long run it is viable? What I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> From my uh, analysis, and I may be wrong, I think 
ASEAN countries individually are bound to pick sides. In other words, you, you, you see that happening now, right, with Philippines and Vietnam. And with uh, Myanmar, on the other hand, not, not so much with China, but then. So help me make sense of this panoramic situation in ASEAN today. Okay. Thank uh, you. Sorry, where, where are you from? I'm from India, North East okay. India. Okay. Well, you have to understand that ASEAN is a big family. <clears throat> the analogy between, of ASEAN is, is a big family. In, in a big family, members of the family have different interests, different inclination, uh, different levels of wealth. We may disagree on some issues, but at the end of the day, we're still one family. I think that's true in ASEAN. In ASEAN, you have countries at different levels of economic development, different threat scenarios, uh, different aspirations, but we realize that we belong to one region. And if we don't hang together, we will hang separately. So it's better to hang together. So the galvanizing motivation of the countries in ASEAN is a realization that by ourselves, we are weak and can be exploited. But when we are united at 10, we gain strength from each other. When we speak at 10, our voice is amplified. When we are able at 10 <clears throat> to invite the United States and China and the Russians to sit together with us, we are performing a very valuable deed for the world, not just for ourselves, you know? So don't be distracted by the differences among the family. Yes, we are different. We are different, but we are united. The Indonesian national motto is very relevant here. It's called unity in diversity. So the beauty of ASEAN is that we are united even though we are different. Your first question is very interesting. <clears throat> Would the United States feel threatened if India was a rising power? Washington would be less alarmed because they see India as a democracy. But yes, if one day India rises to become a peer power of the United States and is willing to challenge the American for regional leadership and global leadership, the Americans will fight you. The Americans have been masters of the universe for so long. They're not about to give it up. You know? And I know the American character. Some of my friends in Singapore, like Kishon Babobani, keep saying that, oh, the Chinese will surpass the American one day. So the American might get used to being number two. He's wrong. The American will never accept to be number two. And it means going to war to maintain their number one position, they will do so. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, very interesting question, Professor Seliku, and uh, your handling and illuminative reply. Uh, I would asked uh, Dr. Tohan Shi to ask his question, but he says to you, Professor Ko, that sorry, I cannot speak because I have no mic. <laughs> My question for Professor Ko is this. Will America behave like U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles? in the 1950s in pressuring Asian countries not to be neutral, but to support America against China? Uh, by the way, Tohan Shi is a very famous journalist based in Hong Kong. And he's a very good friend of mine. So I'm very happy that he, he joined us in this dialogue. I would say to Han Shi that John Foster Dulles was not very successful. He only managed to persuade Thailand and the Philippines to join the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CETO. The rest of us refused to join them. The majority of the countries in the region wanted to be non-aligned. They didn't want to be aligned with the Americans against the Russians or against the Chinese. 
I say this is, this is true today, you know. If you ask most of the countries, do you want to be aligned or you want to be non-aligned? I think a majority in ASEAN will say, we want to be non-aligned. Some countries for historical reason or geographical reason will say that I have no choice but to be aligned in order to protect myself against a much bigger country. And the Philippines may feel this. We understand. We, in, in ASEAN family, we accept all views. No? We don't say, hey, you must be non-aligned. You cannot be an ally of the United States or ally of the Chinese. We, we can't say that because every country in ASEAN is sovereign. And as a sovereign country, you have every right to decide on your foreign policy. And if you, if you decide that your national interest is best served by aligning yourself with a superpower, you have every right to do that. And we respect you. <clears throat> but when you take part in a meeting of 10, we tell you, put aside your individual preference. You must now think not as an individual country, but think as ASEAN. And the majority of ASEAN say, ASEAN as an organization must remain neutral. And even the countries which are aligned say, we agree. This happened in Jakarta a few months ago, and President Jokowi was able to say, ASEAN is not an ally of any great power. And I agree with that. So, so I would say to Han Shi that uh, you can't repeat the 1950s, you know. And, and even if the Americans were to try, which I don't think they're trying, uh, they will not succeed, you know. I think President Biden, Anthony Blinken, you know, are much more sophisticated. I mean, they know the world, they want to, they're friendly to all, even with the adversary, they're very friendly to the Chinese, you know. The Americans keep sending very senior people to visit China to try to restart dialogue with the Chinese. And let's hope that next month in November, when APEC meets in San Francisco, that there will be a side meeting between President Biden and President Xi. But even if such a meeting were to take place, it's not going to solve the fundamental contradiction between them. They will remain. This struggle between the United States and China is structural and go, go on for many, many years until either one side capitulate or they come to a conclusion that it's a draw and we must agree to coexist with each other. Thank you, Professor Ko, for that. And uh, finally, uh, if Mr. Raj Sharma, who is on our uh, advisory board, if he has a question, uh, he can go ahead now. Well, thank you, Harish. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ko, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Um, it's interesting that ASEAN chooses to be and play a neutral role, but but I would think that because of individual states' long-term interests that evolve over time, uh, particularly in this in this in this uh, in the struggle between the PRC and the United States vying for supremacy in the long run, would that create fissures? And what does ASEAN try to do to prevent that from, you know, uh, prevent that from, from some sort of unraveling its core charter? Yeah. Um, we, we can't solve the problems of the two superpowers, but we can invite them to sit with us at the same table. Ah. We can repeatedly tell them, Please talk to each other. Please try to rebuild trust between the you, two of you. And even though you have, you have differences in some area, but there are important issues in the world on which you should work together, like climate change, like pandemic. You know, there are many issues in the world where we need both China and, and the United States to be with us. And so we, the ASEAN country keep repeating to the Chinese and Americans that please try to talk to each other, rebuild trust. Don't escalate 
your differences and please don't get into an armed conflict over Taiwan or some other issue. Right, 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 right. I think that's that's very much on, on most people's minds these days, particularly with the the recent developments in the Middle East. Thank you very much, Raj. I think we now move into our concluding moments. Uh, 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 Dr. Julie Mehta. Prof. Ko, I have one niggling little question. We've really been through the universal uh, approaches to the key question today, and you've done an only as you can an inimitable job. My question is, Rohingyas seem to be the fracture currently. How do you think or is there a way of solving this refugee issue or the issue of human rights or however you want to look at the Rohingya issue? What would you say? <clears throat> it's a tragedy with no solution. I, I feel for the Rohingyas, you know. They are a people unwanted by their own country. <clears throat> and it's shocking to me that my good friends in Myanmar, especially the Burmans, of all political persuasion, including the great lady Aung San Suu Kyi, refuse to recognize the Rohingya as a people that belong to Myanmar. She even refuses to call them Rohingya. You know, she call, call them illegals or Bengalis, or, you know. There's a blind spot among the Burmans about the Rohingya. <clears throat> but we in the ASEAN country recognize them as a people, and we call them by their proper name, the Rohingya. We think they belong to Myanmar. We think the military was wrong to expel them and to, to make it impossible for them to live at peace and security in their own country. But ASEAN is a prisoner of our own charter, of our ethos, which is that we don't interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. So we can't tell the Myanmar government that, please, recognize Rohingya as a people, as a minority. We can't do that. All we can do is to help the Rohingya, which we do, you know, which we do, we give them help, in, in Cox Bazaar in, in Bangladesh, we try to bring help to the Rohingyas and other minorities in Myanmar. Uh, but there's a limit to what we can do. At the end of the day, there's no solution without the Burman recognizing the Rohingya as a minority that belongs to the country. It, it's a tragedy. You know. Thank you very much, Professor Ko. <clears throat> we <clears throat> thank you very much for <clears throat> for, for uh, your for spending so much time, uh, giving so much time and effort, and putting in so much thought, and uh, bringing all your wealth of experience, uh, and sort of nutshelling it for us today, uh, clarifying so many uh, important issues that surround ASEAN and the world. Uh, so let me let me just conclude by saying that. That, that I'm an all-weather friend of India. I believe in India when my Indian friend don't believe in India. And uh, some of you may know that I've edited two books on India. The first book was called India on Our Minds, with a forward by Ko Chok Tong, the champion of India. And it was launched by Prime Minister Lee Sen Long. Last year, I produced another book, and it's called the ASEAN India, The Way Forward. You see, when India decided not to sign the Regional Economic Partnership Agreement, this was a blow to ASEAN, you know, because ASEAN wanted so much for India to be in RCEP so that RCEP will not be dominated by one country. We need India in RCEP. So it was very disappointing to the ASEAN country that India decided to opt out. So what I wanted to do is change this atmosphere and say, okay, this has happened, accept it, 
put it in the back. Let's look forward. We have a new agenda for cooperation between India and ASEAN. And, and look at my book to see what the agenda is. So I want to conclude by saying that I continue to believe in India. I hope India will get will solve its internal problem and achieve much greater economic progress than it's done in the past. There's no reason why the Indian economy can't be as big as the Chinese economy. There's no reason why India-ASEAN trade cannot be as large <coughs> as Chinese-ASEAN trade. There's no reason why India's investment in ASEAN can't be as great as Chinese investment. So as a friend of India, I plead with you, please up your gain with ASEAN. There's so much more we can do to upgrade the relationship between India and ASEAN. And you can count on me to work with you to achieve this goal. Thank you very much for those words. Uh, we can't thank you enough. And on behalf of Rising Asia Foundation, our trustees, our, <clears throat> our, our president and our various boards, uh, some of whom have attended uh, today's uh, distinguished annual lecture by Professor Tommy Ko, all the way from the University of Alaska, um, and uh, the senator from uh, Yun Pao Wu from Canada, uh, senior minister Yang Muli. Uh, Yang Muli from Cambodia. And Meera Chan, who is <laughs> the Singapore <laughs> spirit for all of us all over the world, and such a good friend of Prof Ko's. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Prof Ko and Julie and Harish. I've learned a lot today. It's been illuminating and informative. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank yes, you. I think I can speak for all of us to say that we have all learned a lot you. Uh, because, you know, to get the perspective from a, such a senior, uh, senior uh, uh, academic and statesman and such a senior career diplomat, uh, probably the senior most, uh, if I'm not wrong, in ASEAN, um, to get his views is, is, is a delight, you know, and it's it really, it's a pleasure to have heard mm -hmm. all this uh, in the way that you put it across with so much clarity, uh, shorn of uh, a jargon or verbiage that, that of, often obfuscates yeah. issues in a way that you reached out to us and to our audiences and you will reach out to more once yeah. this uh, video goes uh, viral. <laughs> And your speech goes even more viral when <coughs> published in our in our journal in the coming months. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.